Grady Booch returns today for the latest in a series of lectures that are the foundation for a major work that he's undertaken and an international advisory board is helping. It's a large-scale view of computing's evolution, its ongoing impact, and its implications for society's future. The project is called Computing the Human Experience. And if you think of uh, cosmos meets computing, you've got the idea about what this project is really all about. His ultimate output will be a major book published by O'Reilly Publishing, a great deal of digital media, and we hope a multi-part television series, perhaps with PBS or the BBC, as well as, of course, this lecture series. Now, many of you know that Grady is a, an IBM fellow. He is a legend in software development, and my favorite role is that he's a trustee at the Computer History Museum. But today, he's here as a scholar and presenter, and he is looking at how computing can be used both for good and for not so good by government. The title of the lecture is Anarchy in Order, and it's my pleasure to welcome back Grady Booch. Thank you. Welcome back. So even though I'm up here and my lips are moving, I have to give credit to my co-collaborator and my wife, Jan. This is as much hers as it is mine. If you see her, don't shake her right hand. She broke her hand last night. It seems that she got in this fierce debate about Java versus Node.js, <laughs> and there was a bar fight, and it's, it got ugly. But you should see the other guy. He didn't turn out quite so well. Also, a shout out to Adam, who's sitting beside Jan. Adam has been a longtime volunteer for our project, so thank you for all the help you have done. And I don't know if they're here yet, but there was a high school class from Colorado. Are you here? I spoke with them by Skype, and I think they're coming as well, so they'll be around. Um, I also want to thank the museum for making this possible. Thank you very much, and especially for John Holler, who has helped so much with regards to our, our project here. So thank you, John, especially. I'm excited to report that, oh, I think here comes the class. Hello, hello, welcome, woohoo, welcome from Colorado. Yeah, hi. These are the people who will be debugging the code you wrote today. <laughs> so beware. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit of an update. If you come to our website, which is here, uh, we just published a new newsletter. You'll see there that in working with our producer from the UK, a gentleman by the name of Roy Ackerman, uh, he's, we've worked very closely with KQED. They helped us pitch the project to corporate PBS. Uh, that was pretty successful. We've now since subsequently pitched it to National Geographic and the Discovery Channel. So, you know, we're making progress here. I've learned that the movie business moves even slower than software sometimes, so be patient. It took 10 years or 15 years for for Sagan to get Cosmos on the air, so be patient. We're only in year five or year six. Also, here's my Twitter address. I don't know if you're aware of this, but every time I gain a new Twitter follower, an angel gets its wings. So <laughs> please feel free to follow me. Uh, in our work, we have been looking at the intersection of computing and the human experience. Our mantra is that the story of computing is very much the story of humanity, and they intersect in some very profound and exciting and unexpected ways. In the last three lectures, we've looked at the intersection of computing and war, in computing and the computability of the mind, and even computing and faith. And today, we will examine the intersection of computing and governments. Now, you may think we'd start in some smoke-filled room filled with powerful people, but no, instead we're going to start with potholes. Because if you think about it, potholes are a good thing. And we're going to see a lot more of them as the thaw comes on the east. But they're a good thing because they represent for me the fact that we have a government in place that can make such roads. So next time you hit a pothole, celebrate the fact that your government's there, in a way. Spin it around. But yeah, yeah, you know, potholes aren't the greatest thing, but at least we have a government of some structure that has led us to that. If you think about it, too, how potholes and, and the highway system came to be, in a large part, it came about through what Eisenhower did when his administration bringing together this interstate network. Well, what happens when potholes of old and all the infrastructure we place there comes together with modern technology. Well, of course, there's an app for it. Um, if you're in Chicago, you could download this app so that you as a, as a citizen 
soldier, I guess, can then report these things so that we, in effect, crowdsource the repair, the identification and the repair of, uh, of potholes. It leads to the interesting question then, what good are governments for? I mean, how's it, how's it working for you so far? Well, let's go back to first principles as well and examine what Thomas Jefferson has to say. He reports that the purpose of government is to enable the people of a nation to live in safety and in happiness. That is the ultimate goal of why we band together. Another way to spin it is we form governments, these larger groups, because we hope them, we trust that they will do things that we ourselves cannot individually do. So it is a good question. How is your government working for you? Because every government, every institution is in many ways a living experiment. Well, governments do many things, no doubt about that. They tax us, so that as a business, they do what they need to do. They protect us, they protect our borders, as well as our economic interest. And that leads us to some interesting issues of intellectual property, especially when we deal with property that is not physical. We'll explore that in a bit. They communicate to us, and they also shape opinion, and they monitor our activities. These are all reasonable and right things that governments do, and we yield ourselves to them, we surrender to them in that sense, because they can do things that we ourselves cannot do. But therein lies the fundamental problem. We have some amazing technology, and every government uses technology to advance their needs, but then how do they use computing in the care of human life and our happiness balanced against the same kind of things that the tyranny and the subterfuge might, begin, might bring? This is the fundamental question we shall explore today as we look at the intersection of computing and government. Well, let's look positive for to begin with, because it is no doubt that computing has done many things for us that we ourselves cannot do. Let's look at a very disenfranchised community, that of the homeless. So here in the Bay Area, San Francisco has this website that connects the homeless with caregivers. And you may say, wait a minute, homeless probably don't have computers, how could they connect to these services? And the answer is, it is the larger governmental infrastructure of public libraries, which provide free computing resources that the homeless can come to and find these resources. So, you know, it's a way to match up the needs of the homeless with the care providers themselves. These are all good things in the care and happiness of our life. We also think of things like weather prediction. So this is a map from an earlier day uh, NOAA report, and these are good things to have because we as individuals don't want to do weather prediction on our own, so we band together, we provide the services through our government to do that kind of weather prediction, which, which helps us in our planning, helps us in our lives, helps us in our businesses as well too. This is not a small infrastructure. This is not a small investment on NOAA's part, on the government's part, to do these kinds of things, because we're talking about a large network of sensors, satellites, and computational resources that make this possible. Indeed, the government, no one in particular, continues to invest in this space. There is, for example, what's called a high-resolution rapid refresh system, which now gives us resolution down to, and prediction and modeling down to three square kilometers with the ability to produce new updates about every two hours. So we can see changing weather conditions much more rapidly than we ever could in the past, and that's a good thing. But remember, again, the balance, a large investment to benefit our happiness, but there are also costs associated with it. Now, living in Maui, we worry about things like earthquakes around the world, because if something happens in the Pacific Rim, then ultimately it's going to flow to us. And so what you see here is a prediction of tsunami effects based upon the major earthquake that happened in Japan a few years ago. Um, it showed that it wasn't going to hit us majorly, but these kinds of things are very, very important to us. It's a curious thing that happens with earthquake prediction. And this was reflected in a wonderful cartoon by XKCD. It seems that gravita the, the waves from an earthquake will travel around three to five kilometers per second, but fiber communications goes around 200,000 kilometers per second. So a curious phenomenon happens about 100 kilometers out from the epicenter in that the tweets of people recording the earthquake actually outstrip the speed of the earthquake itself. So we in Hawaii will find out about the earthquake faster by following Twitter than we will by following the earthquake reports from Boulder. Amazing kind of thing. Major investment, it talks about an infrastructure of governments that span the globe. And it's a good thing because we individually 
could not look at these kinds of things. But we yield to our governments to provide that kind of infrastructure. We see it also in our health care. Uh, the Center for Disease Control has a vast infrastructure to track diseases and outbreaks, and this is a good thing. Here we have an example of a recent outbreak of listeria that was tracked back to a specific batch of caramel apples from one particular vendor. And you may say, well, you know, why do we need that kind of infrastructure? Because if you have things like Ebola or measles, you want to trace back, but again, it requires an infrastructure. What strikes me in this particular case is we're dealing with seven deaths, which, and each death is certainly important, but only a couple of dozen people that were hospitalized. And I think it is a testament to the goodness of what we do here that in a population of several hundreds of millions, we build the infrastructure to care about just a few. That indeed is, in my measure, a contribution to the health and happiness and safety of us. We see this also in our infrastructure of flying. What you're seeing here is uh, a reproduction of the airline traffic that happened in 9-11. The first uh, aircraft hit around 9 for 8.45, and we began clearing the air at 9.45. So again, even in circumstances like this, we yield, we rely, we surrender upon our governments, we trust them to do the right thing for us. Major infrastructure. Governments also tax us. And herein lies an interesting story. Um, the first real computerization of our tax system in the U.S. came about in 1955. It was an IBM 650 put in the Kansas City Regional Office. And then it was around 1961 that we began to see complete automation of all of our taxing system. This was with a series of IBM 770s to do all of it. Today, to do our taxes, vast infrastructure, because it's not just doing our taxes, but we now see a system that feeds in lots of data sources that enables governments to track things like fraud, to discover and connect the dots among multiple sources of income, to track this against other financial records it might have. So on the one hand, it's a good structure to have. We yield ourselves to our governments in this sense to, to help fund what we're doing, all these other things that I described, but it also requires a major investment. Speaking of that investment, it is the case that there is code running today in our tax system that was written back in 61. So I kid you not, having a chance to work with the IRS, the core code of our tax system is actually still written in IBM 360 assembly language. Whoa, yes. So, so it gets even worse. You remember, may remember a few years ago, I forget which, which Bush it was, but he said, you know, let's give a rebate to all of our, to all of our citizens to, to spur, you know, spur the economy. And as it turns out, the, the IRS had to scramble because the government may say, do this, but it actually means you've got to change some code. And there was a guy who knew the code base to do it. And that guy was on vacation at the time. So they had to track him down, bring him back, and make the code change. So it begins to show to you the vast infrastructure we have built, and yet how fragile it is. And therefore, I would observe that we are faced with the same kind of problem we have with our potholes, that it requires the reinvestment over time, just like with our road system, we must do with our increasing code system, because we have this vast amount of legacy. Now, one of the consequences that's happening is that we're seeing the growth of open data to our governments. There is data.gov, which opens up a tremendous amount of data sets. Fascinating stuff. There's, if you peruse this, there are lots of interesting things. One of the debates about this is, are we now not making it possible for third parties to make money off of this? And the critics will say, that's terrible. And I would say, yes, that's good because now the government has collected all these things, let's indeed yield to capitalism in ways that our government themselves could not exploit those resources, in ways that are much more nimble. So the opening of data, I believe, is a good thing. It's not just us, by the way, but many countries around the world, even Kenya has opened up a lot of its data. So if you're an enterprising Kenyan entrepreneur, you have at your disposal a vast set of data resources for which you could apply the resources we have in computing to bring it to the benefit of your government. A good thing indeed. But there's a dark side we must consider. Openness and transparency we celebrate, 
but can one be too open and too transparent? From public data sources, it is possible and has been done to plot out our electrical grid down to the transformer level. These things are part of our public record. You can do a similar thing with gas lines as well too. Now, suppose I were an evil genius. It's a good thing I'm not. My evil laugh's not so good, I've gotta work on it. One million dollars. Um, yes, some of you have watched Austin Powers. I'm looking for volunteers from Mini-Me, if anyone would like to come. Um, but it is the case that were I an evil genius, uh, then I could take a look at this and say, hmm, where could I best disrupt the electrical grid of our country or one particular region by blowing up this transformer? As an example, there is in Brownsfield, uh, Texas, there is a major chemical plant that processes chlorine and if you were to bring down the electrical grid for a sustained time, thereby bringing that plant down, you would probably, and if you did it, by the way, in the fall time frame, and I'm not telling you to do this, please, this is, then you would probably disrupt the entire food chain of the United States. Why? Because in bringing down the electrical grid, and bringing down this chlorine plant, which produces most of the chlorine for the United States, you would have impacted the production of just-in-time fertilizer, which would have been necessary for the planting season, which would have disrupted planting for the next year. We have built, through computing, just-in-time networks, and although it's very powerful, it is also very fragile. Therefore, it is reasonable to say that, yes, we must have this balance between openness and transparency and those things that do not make us safe. Well, let's look at another aspect of this, and this comes back to governments counting its citizens. <clears throat> In India, there has been for the last several years a major census underway. Now here we are in a country of 1.4 billion people and for the longest time most of those people simply were not counted. And thinking again for the health and safety and happiness of its people, it was a good thing to do this counting because many of the disenfranchised in India simply were not receiving the services they needed and furthermore there was considerable fraud going on. People would have some ration cards and people would be reusing it and there was no identification that it really was the right person it was going to. So a major effort was undertaken to indeed take a catalog of everyone in India but they did so in ways that may not be palatable here to us in the United States. Remember that every country has different views about privacy and security. So in India, what went on is that you would have your photograph taken and your fingerprint and you would be given a unique identification number, each individual. So now the government was truly talking to every person and identifying them in some particular biometric ways. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Now, you may say, what may be the bad size? Well, one of the things the Indian government has done, which probably would never fly here in the United States, is they now have a website. So if you're a government employee, you go into work, and there's a biometric scanner at your, at, your, at your door of your office, and you check in. And it is through that database that they can actually keep track of if their government workers are actually coming to work. Amazing amount of what we might consider intrusion. Let's look at our census taking here in the United States. The Constitution speaks of, empowers Congress to collect a census. So it's a good thing. But clearly, the, the, the people who wrote this could never have anticipated the kind of population that we had it, we would have or the mechanisms to do so. Now, it was not through the Constitution, but it was through a particular US code that then made some specific references to what we would do with that data. In particular, it's, I'll read it, it's Title 13 of the U.S. Code dictates that any information we collect from the census will be kept anonymized and private for 72 years, roughly the lifespan of most people. And therefore you'd say, well, gee, it won't be until the next generation that I find out the details of a particular person. It is a fascinating study to look back at the different questions that were asked along the way because this reflects the notion that big data even in the 1780s and 1790s, reflects biases, reflects the state of the time, it reflects the needs of the nation. So back in 1790, you would be asked, how many slaves do you have? We don't ask that anymore, obviously. How many white males do you have? How many white women? How many other? 
If you jump to 1890, this is a particularly important time, asking a bunch of other questions. Can you read or write? But this, of course, was also the period in which we first used the Hollerith machine to do our accounting. Go downstairs and take a look at one of them. It's awesome to see. And now it changed the calculation of the census from about every six to eight years to about six weeks, vastly changing the ways in which the government could track its people. Now, given that amount of data, you can do some fascinating things. This is, again, one of the really cool things about big data. And we, every age has a big data problem. I view big data as basically more data that you know how to handle with given your current technology. So it's always a growing problem for you. But the cool thing about this kind of data set is that now I can begin to do some really fascinating correlations that, that tell me unexpected things. For example, did you know that if you follow the marriage rate in Alabama, it tracks the number of electrocutions by electrical lines. So, uh, I don't know. Maybe if you're in Alabama, many, many people are getting married by electrical lines. Uh, could be it's, I don't know. But the point is that correlation is not causation. So, so it's not. So again, big data has its biases. Big data also must be careful. We must be careful in how we use it. Remember what I said earlier about the US law saying that all census data will be kept private for 72 years? In times of war, governments do strange things. For example, they take the data they collected and they use it in unexpected ways. Like in World War II, using census data to find out who was a US citizen but still of Japanese origin. And what did we do with that data? We collected such people and put them in internment camps even though they were citizens. So governments in times of war do strange things and therefore again we have this issue of balance. How do I balance the benefits that computing and the technology offers us against the needs of the state? Let's unfold for a moment how governments do this. How do we use big data to find the bad guys and perhaps even find some of his good guys? And we'll start with a drug lord. Uh, this happens to be a gentleman who was arrested, uh, a Mexican drug lord. Um, and one of the techniques used to find him was a concept called NORA, um, non-obvious relationship awareness. Now, this example is fabricated, but it's one that actually grew up from works in the casino by a guy named Jeff Jonas, a fellow at IBM, who was looking at the, the casinos commissioned him to help find the bad guys, the people who were cheating. And these same techniques we see now used among certain three-letter agencies. So let's suppose this guy has a girlfriend. Why is it the bad guys always have great-looking girlfriends? <laughs> So here's an example, however, of correlation is not necessarily causation. I have a beautiful wife. <laughs> and yet here I am a good guy. So see? <laughs> so suppose for a moment that this bad guy has a girlfriend and this girlfriend happens to rent an apartment. And so apartment rentals and details of apartments are semi-public information. Bad guy number two, who might happen to have an LLC, and what we might discover is that the LLC and that apartment have a phone number in common. And therefore, there may be a relationship between these two. So in effect, what, what we have with Nora is to not look from the data down, but to look for an assumption and find the data that fits it. So it's a matter of using vast amounts of data to find things and, and, and make assumptions and find the data that fits it. So this is why, one of the reasons why we see governments, ours in particular, that like to collect lots of data because we can't always know what kind of connections there may be, but we like to look in reverse. No doubt, there is a vast amount of information collected upon us. Not just the things that we do, like loans and working on Google and, and browsing the web, but also devices, your phone, your Fitbit, uh, which you can use to discover when a person's having sex. 
Kid you not, because it's vibrating at certain hours you may not expect, and maybe it does it as irregular times. Or for that matter, your, your smart meter. I can then, by looking into it, because it's just a Wi-Fi connection, generally, I can then say, is this person doing laundry at this hour or on this day? Do they do it on a regular basis? When has that person left home? And I just saw a report just came out yesterday that by simply looking at the energy use of your telephone, your cell phone, we can begin to infer some things about you. This is the notion of metadata. But you may say, well, it's just metadata. Do we really need to worry about it? Well, this is one of those words that sounds right and sounds harmless. But remember that metadata is still just data. And I can still do some amazing things with it. Let's unpack what we can do with our metadata. So, simple, basic tweet from The Guardian. I think I just heard an angel get its wings, because someone followed me. Thank you. Um, simple tweet, but if we look at the stuff below it, we see that there's a lot of metadata, data about the data, uh, where it was sent, from where, the time zone, the language it was in, all these kinds of things. Can I do things with metadata? Well, we looked at Nora and how it looks at data itself. Let's look at a real life example of how metadata got to someone. We have here Jill Kelly, nice looking woman, socialite in DC, and she had a friendly relationship with an FBI agent and she complained that somebody is cyber stalking me. Now, probably mistake number one, this FBI agent my opinion, probably overstepped his bounds by taking in the needs of a private citizen going further with it. Cyber stalking is not a bad thing by any means, but clearly there was a personal relationship going on here that went a little bit further. And it was discovered as he began looking into information that indeed it was a woman who was doing this. It was the woman Paula Broadwell who was cyber stalking her. And it just so happens that Paula Broadwell was the biographer of Petraeus. So the FBI agent began to say, hmm, these two women seem to be very cozy with some generals. Is there a problem going on here? And they went further by looking at metadata. And it was discovered that these two used email. No surprise, she was his biographer. That's cool. We don't want to look at the data itself, but let's see what they were doing to one another. As it turns out, there was not two email accounts but there was one email account, and Petraeus thought he was being very clever by saying, I am going to go into my email account, which Paula shares, I am going to write an email and draft it, but I'm not going to send it, and it stays there as a draft. So Paula can come in and look at my draft and respond to it with another draft. So in effect, the email's not going through the network, the cloud, but it was only through the drafts itself. However, metadata will get you in the end Traffic analysis gets you in the end. Because the suspicions of the FBI agent said, well, wait a minute, let's look at this account. And he began to see from where the logins were happening and at what times, and discovering, curiously, they were happening in different parts of the world, very close to one another in the same time. Therefore, it could not be the same person. What do you do to the next level? Well, you go to the hotels from which those Wi-Fi points are, identify who the guest lists are, and if you see enough data points, you begin to discover, oh my goodness, Paula is emailing Petraeus. And thus, poof, they were found out. Now, this leads to some really, I think, profound questions that need to be asked out in the open. Is this the kind of thing government should be doing? Is this the kind of thing where personal relationships should be a measure of how one's professional impact is going on? Don't know. In his case, you know, it's a little bit different story because he was, you know, he was a general and what he was doing. So yes, maybe there are some suspicions. But taken to the nth, you end up with something like this. These kind of data networks. This one was written by hand after World War II by the German police in East Germany, the Stasi. And it was used, same kind of networks, same kind of metadata collection, although done by hand, and yet the same kind of results. 
You may say, well, don't all governments do this? And yes, there are many such examples. You may not have known of this, but there's this project that was called uh, Project Cybersyn, a Chilean project. This looks so 70s. This is so amazing. In fact, as I look at this, it reminds me in style of the, uh, the Honeywell computer, the, the, the kitchen computer, which, John, isn't there one downstairs? Yeah. It's sort of the same designer kind of thing. And this was set up by the, uh, the Chilean uh, president, Salvador Allende, not especially a nice guy, but his intent was to filter in all the data the government could have, uh, real-time data and other data, into one room so that, in effect, they could monitor what was going on in Chile and, you know, control things that were going on. After he was ousted, the room was destroyed, but it indicates that you see governments despotic ones in particular, tend to migrate to the technology to expand their power. Now, you may say, we'd never do that. We're the good guys. We're the good guys. Trust us. But as it turns out, there is a much beloved president, and I'm not talking Bush, Clinton, Reagan, or whatever, a much beloved president who laid the seeds for this, and it turns out to be Lincoln. Where did Lincoln have to do with this? Lincoln did not have email, but Lincoln had T-mail. He was obsessed by the telegraph. This was the time of the beginning of the Victorian internet. We saw the laying of telegraph lines following railroads, initially used to track what was going on with timetables for railroads, but increasingly used for commerce and social communication. As the war broke out, and communication with his generals in the field became more difficult. What Lincoln decided to do is to take all of the telegraph connections that were in Washington, and he ordered them to be terminated in an office right next to the White House. So in effect, he, had, he was the first president to have access to pretty much all the telegraph communication that was going on within the nation, and he used that to take, keep track of what was happening in his country. He also used it to command his generals, as you see here in this report. They just discovered from the U.S. archives uh, a few of the telegraphs he sent. This is one of them. Um, he was basically asking after this battle of Vicksburg, you know, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> and why aren't you following up? And he was pretty pissed at his generals. And he would see, if you follow this, a fascinating study that he was really directing his generals from afar by using this electronic communication, but also watching what was happening as well. If you think about it, in our age of computing, modern age of computing, it's relatively new for us. The first president to send an email was Clinton. And it was really kind of a fabricated event. John Glenn was up in space. John Glenn and his wife had met with Clinton and, and his wife uh, a few days before. They'd had a dinner, and for some PR event, they decided, let's, John Glenn sent an email down, and so they said, let's do a photo op and have Clinton send an email back up. Turns out that's not even his computer. They had to borrow it from, I think, uh, the, the chief physician who was there at a time, and this is the email that went back up. We've come a long ways. Uh, Obama is the first president who I think is really deeply wired. Uh, he got into a snit with Secret Service as he was first you know, inaugurated because he loved his Blackberry. Um, as I recall, you've got, I think here at the museum, there's some of the team who worked on Obama's uh, nomination and, and all, the, all, all the, uh, uh, the plans for his, his election, I think, are coming here. So, you know, go chat with them about it. But he was a very, very wired president, no doubt. The first president to really to be very, very wired. First president to program as well. So along with Code.org, he sat down with this young woman and they taught him how to code. Um, they also coupled together with Disney, by the way. So if you go into this, it's pretty cool. It's basically a system that allows you to take Elsa. If you have a daughter, if you have a young girl in your life, you know a Frozen, certainly. If you don't, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but they built a special version for, for him so he could actually write some JavaScript. And this is the bold statement that President Obama wrote, to move forward 100, woohoo. Uh, I believe it was uh, next day on the news, Fox News came out and, and complained that he didn't move forward far enough. <laughs> but everybody's a programming critic. All right. Um, that's our government. Let's look at another one. Let's look at China. So what is their reaction to networks? Well, one of the reasons I think 
Zuck, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been learning Mandarin and spending his time there is because penetrating the great firewall of China is very, very difficult. Facebook is not allowed. Twitter is not allowed. Gmail is not allowed for the ma major part. But it's microblogging sites like, such as this that are permitted, but they're also very well protected and covered by the government itself. Well, you may say, to what degree? Well, filtering happens in a number of ways. In the Great Firewall, one of the simple filterings it done is if you try to go, if you're inside China and try to go someplace you're not allowed to go, then their firewalls say, oh, this is an IP address I don't allow. We're going to, you know, prevent you from going there. But by the way, we're going to keep track that it's you. This is, again, one of the reasons why the Chinese government really resists anonymization on the web. They want anybody having a website, anybody using the web, to know who that person is. So that's one kind of filtering, which is sort of blocking of traffic itself, but even the real-time thing. So if I use certain words, they are filtered. So for example, a simple word like snow lion flag. If I type that, then it's going to be, you know, uh, it's going to be censored. Why is that the case? Turns out to be an aphorism for the flag of Tibet. And there are a number of such phrases like that. There's a great book called Blocked on Weibo. There's a website as well, too, which will give you the latest words that are used. And there are innocuous ones, like 50 Cent is blocked, not because of the rapper, but because 50 Cent represents uh, the slang term used for how much they pay the Chinese citizens who monitor these services. So it's an ongoing battle between this, this war, if you will, between the... Uh, uh, the, the government itself and the people who wish to, to wish to exploit it for their purposes. And again, you may say, we'd never do this kind of thing. We'd never do that kind of blocking the United States. Well, of course, what about BART, who shut off all Wi-Fi and cell access in their system, uh, given some of the turbulence that happened in their system a few years ago? So again, governments reacting to blocking off communication. Now, this has led to much debate about the notion of should we have an internet off switch? This is a great example of how, how profoundly stupid some politicians are. And I, I say that with all the goodness in my heart. Because you can't turn off the internet. It's not designed to do so. As, as Ted Stevens said, it's more than just this collection of tubes. You can't turn it off. And as we see here from John Gilmore, he points out the net interprets censorship Censorship is damage and routes around it. It's a good thing. So again, we see this interesting battle between our technology and the governments themselves. And we may lament that, balance, that battle, but I actually celebrate the balance, the fact that there are those two forces that compete against one, one another, because they make possible activism against governments that are abusive, and it gives rise to that technology to fight those governments. At the same time, our governments help us. We use that same technology to fight back against them. It's also, of course, given rise to the legion we call anonymous. Let's speak of them as hacktivists. Um, most of you know this, but you know why do they use this particular uh, mask? It is Gifo, Guy Fox from the Gunpowder Plot, uh, taken on as, as the symbol for the activist kind of hacking that goes on here. Um, is it a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know, but it's just a thing, and it represents for me the rise you see of the populace against the oppressiveness of what governments can do with this technology. So unto itself, it is a reflection for me of the balance that naturally takes place because of the nature of the human spirit. We see this dance between the two. Now, there are a myriad of other things that I could speak of as you look at the problems of the rule of law. We have embraced computing technology so rapidly, every front of the law is under siege in a way. The notion of fairness on the internet, the notion of what 3D printers do for us relative to copyright protection. It used to be that you didn't worry about that kind of thing because the cost of manufacturing were so high. You'd never have to deal with somebody replicating, say, a Coke bottle, but now it becomes possible for an individual to do so Computing changes the economics of it, and it certainly vastly changes the nature of intellectual property. What does it mean to have something that I protect that has no physical instantiation? This is a place where I am not a lawyer, but we see the battlegrounds being laid. One of the subtle places that is not so obvious, because these are things very much in the news, is a simple matter of where can data live? 
So if I have a cloud service, many countries require certain data to be physically within the country itself. Now that may sound stupid because bits do not know about national boundaries, but national laws do protect them in that matter. And that's one of the things that makes cloud computing so complicated, the fact that that data must be present. Let's look at one specific problem of rule of law that at first glance you may say, well, the law is pretty clear here in the United States. It's about the sanctity of our packages, that the government has no right to look into our mail. Let's, let's tease that apart for a moment because it has some very profound implications for what happens in our electronic communication. There are many countries who, as part of their Bill of Rights, as part of their Constitution directly, protect correspondence. Estonia, Iceland, Belgium, but not the United States. You may be surprised to know that it is not part of our law code directly in the Constitution of the Bill of Rights that protects the contents of our communication, but it's only been through the adjudication of certain cases, Hill versus the US was one important one, that led to refining the light rights of that. And basically it says that, okay, we won't let postal officials or anybody associated with the postal office actually open up your packages unless there is some sort of warrant. So again, it's not a fundamental right, but it's an adjudicated right that's been given to us. So already we see that we are on a little bit of fuzzy grounds when it comes to electronic communication. That leads us to the NSA and its vast data storage in the hillside of, uh, of, of Utah. You may remember in my last lecture, I spoke of uh, the large data center that the Mormon church has to keep track of all census data. I don't know what it is about Utah, but man, Utah loves bits for some reason, truly does. Um, and Snowden, of course, has certainly disclosed to us all the ways in which the NSA has, has captured data. It is, let's make this assumption. Let's make the assumption that the NSA can and has collected data of any electronic form from any computer in any part of the world. Let's assume that to be true. I think that's a reasonable assumption. Now, you may be surprised, however, to hear what my stand on that is. I think it is a good thing that our governments collect all that data, but I think it's a very, very bad thing in the way it has been done because we have done so without the checks and balances. Governments work when there are checks and balances. Governments work when there is openness and transparency. And what hurts me the most is in this process, there hasn't been that checks and balance. There hasn't been that openness and transparency. I want my borders to be safe. I want my electronic communication to be safe. And as part of being a citizen, I do surrender to my governments in the way that I trust that they will do the right things. And that trust only happens if there is that openness and transparency. So we're out of balance. I believe we'll come back into balance. Snowden and others have revealed that we're out of balance. And I trust in our government and our process that we'll get back there. But we aren't there yet, which is why I stand the way I do. One of the things that we have in our arsenal, though, to help us as individual is, of course, encryption. And I've done this particular encryption. I decided to take the Gettysburg Address, and I ran it through the advanced encryption standard with a 256-bit key, and it yields this. There's a website in which you can do it, and I defy you to decrypt that one. Indeed, it would be very, very difficult to do so. So let's, let's unpack this for a moment. Um, on the left-hand side, we began to take a look at the possible number combinations there are with keys of different sizes. Top secret things are reserved the 256 and 192-bit level. These are really, really hard to break. Things like Gmail and the like. And also, if you're dealing with asymmetric uh, key encryption, it's a little bit number, different numbering. Uh, an asymmetric key of like 80 is, is a different number than if you put it in a symmetrical key like this. But for, let's, for, for our purposes now, let's deal with these big ones right here. <clears throat> if I were to sit on the beach and begin to count every individual piece of sand on that beach, on the beach of every beach of the world, on the beach of every world in the solar system, in every solar system in the galaxy, in every galaxy in the, uni in the entire universe. And then if I would also then recount them and count every atom in every one of those bits, I'd only be close to 
the number of things that a 256-bit advanced encryption standard would lead me to. So we're talking a huge, huge number of possibilities, about an order of magnitude from that. So you may say, but wait a minute, we've got some really fast computers. Uh, the fastest computer we have now is one from China. It runs about 3.9 or so uh, petabits, uh, petaflops. Uh, petaflop is 1,000 million million floating point operations per second. So if I were to take that computer and try a brute force algorithm against a 56-bit key, it would take me about 300, about 400 seconds to do it. But if I applied a brute force algorithm to 256 bits, it would take me longer than the age of the universe. So we're not going to get there. So we again see this interesting war between our computational resources and our ability to encrypt and the ways we try to decrypt them, thus entering quantum computing because quantum computing changes the pictures. Here we're talking about computation that happens in one universe. Quantum computing, in effect, does computation in all possible universes simultaneously, which means that it is truly a threat to this kind of encryption. So I think we're good for a while, but that's one of the reasons why you see major investments, and other reasons, major investments in quantum computing. Now, governments take particular views upon this. If you look at uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, he says, you know, we don't want to allow encryption. We think it's a bad thing. Obama has waffled on it. At one time he said, I agree with the Prime Minister. More recently he said, no, encryption is a good thing, as long as we have the keys themselves. So here's where I land on this one. I think encryption is a good thing, because if you begin to disallow private unassailable communication between individuals, it's not a false, far step from there. It's a slippery step to say, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? And we certainly don't want to go down that path. As it turns out, though, encryption is not the weak point in the system. What we see here is a chart that lists all the possible ways I might attack a network, and every organization is going to exploit these in interesting ways. Thus, the NSA has its supercomputers and the like, but on the other hand, they use just plain old detective work to get us there. Again, you'd say, but you know, gosh, we're the good guys. We'd never do these kinds of things like put back doors in computer equipment uh, as we fear the Chinese might do. Well, not only do we do it, we have done it. The Enigma. After World War II, we in the UK had, uh, the UK had broken the Enigma code. If you've seen the Inimitation game, wonderful, wonderful story. Great acting, great story, lousy history, but go see it anyway. Um, it's, it's good enough, and I'm glad it exposes the, the general public to the amazing things that go on. And I could not have imagined a better actor than, than Benedict Cumberbatch as Turing. He, he just absolutely rocked. Um, any anyway, rate, after the war, you know, the UK had broken it. So what did we and the UK do? We picked up all the Enigma machines we could find, and we sold them to our friendly countries. We sold them to South America, we sold them to European countries, but we never bothered to tell them that we had the keys to it. So this is one of the reasons why the UK kept this secret until the 70s, because we were blatantly, with the back door, being able to, to spy upon diplomatic correspondence among most of the countries in the world. Sony comes into the world, into the act here, and this is another good case study to what went on uh, the, so, the hacking at Sony was lamentable. It certainly was devastating. It cost people their jobs and, and cost people their livelihood. If you unpack what happened, you'll discover that, quite frankly, Sony was sloppy. That the unpacking of this said that they failed to update their firmware. They had disgruntled employees who had the keys to the network that were not changed. They had poor password policies. It was just a litany of things. It was a disaster waiting to happen. In some ways, it was no surprise that Sony got hit. But let's look at something a little bit more protected. We, we really still don't know who did it. it some accuse the North Koreans, some accuse others. It's not quite clear. It happened, it was a bad thing. But again, we'd never do that kind of thing, right? Well, take a look, of course, what happened in Iran. We have the president walking through a set of centrifuges. And of course, this is what Stuxnet was all about. The unfolding of Stuxnet is absolutely a fantastic detective story. Because the way Stuxnet came about, this is simplification, it was an utterly brilliant virus, actually a worm that was created, put on a USB dongle. It was the, the, mal, the, the, the infected USB was spread around to many people, and eventually it found itself inside Iran, 
And eventually it found itself on a computer that was attacked to an, an Iranian network that happened to be connected to a specific Siemens device, an industrial system, that happened to control those centrifuges. So we have here a worm. A worm is a virus that travels without human interaction, and it found its way to one of those devices. And it was even more clever. Talk about the brilliance of it. Because it would wake up occasionally and rattle the centrifuge. It was, would go out, it would have it spin faster than it should. And you know, the people working the centrifuge would say, oh, we have a sporadic error. Sporadic errors are always the hardest thing to find. And it waited for a while until there were enough of these worms that it thought would be present so that one day they all kind of went off at once and you could never track it down quickly enough, thereby destroying all of those centrifuges or many of the centrifuges. Was that an act of war? Again, I'm not a legal expert, but from my point of view, sure sounds like one, because if that happened to us, man, we'd be, we'd be lobbing hand grenades over the walls almost immediately. So we see again the ability for a government to have its reach in ways it could never have had before that has profound implications upon the meaning of war. So to put it in simplicity, simplistic sense, what you have here is this ongoing balance, this ongoing battle between privacy and security. It is one that changes every day. It is one that computation has changed in some profound ways. I believe it's also fair to say that there is no privacy in public anymore. We see now the advance of facial recognition. Facebook's rolling this out. One of the reasons that they're investing so much in deep neural networks, one of the reasons that Google is investing so much in it, they have this vast trove of millions of hours of videos. They'd like to monetize it. And so my expectation is if you get facial recognition and image understanding in your videos, do it in real time in the public. In public, you have no privacy whatsoever. Again, is it a good thing and a bad thing? It's a bit of both. It's a good thing because as a citizen, it protects me in ways that I never have could done so before, but it's also scary in that my governments may use that for me in way, against me in ways I never could have anticipated. So it is a balance. We use the phrase that, you know, you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide, a common phrase. I decided to track down, where did that come from? Anybody know where that phrase came from, by any chance? Shout it out among you. Anybody know? Well, this particular phrase came from, as it turns out, Harry Potter in the Deathly Hallows. <laughs> Prius Thickness, who took over the particular part of the college after uh, Vol oops, he who shall not be named took over. And he was basically saying this, you know, hey, don't worry about it if you have nothing nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide. But I think that's, that's actually a BS argument. Let me reframe it. If you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. So my immediate reaction, and this was expressed in a, a brilliant uh, uh, article in the New York Times, my first reaction to this would be, do you have curtains in your house? Can I see pictures of you naked? Would you please show me your credit card records? And so I think every reasonable person would say, well, yeah, I'm not going to show you those things. Well, why is it? Because I don't want to. And I think that's a fair response to us. Privacy is part of being human, very much so that it defines who we are, that we, as our human life, we want to keep some things private. There's a delightful book called Privacy and Solitude in the Middle Ages. And I think one of the things it observes is that Privacy was something that only the wealthy used to have. They could afford their own bedrooms. They could afford their own rooms. And the amazing thing is now everyone can afford that kind of privacy. We don't want to let go of it. It is something that has made us more human. That being said, one of the things that all of these pressures that the governments have done upon us is pushing us into the darker places. If you look at every computer that's in the world on some sort of network, let's represent it by this one large circle. There are some computers that aren't attached to the network. We'll leave them off the side. I don't know how to, how to calculate them, but the, let's say these are the ones who are reachable. The surface web is only about 4%. This is the stuff that's Googleable, that's indexable. And there's a tremendous amount of what we call the deep web that is not available to those kinds of means. And then there is also the dark web, which is a piece of that that is even deeper. And so what you see happening with these pressures of the government to collect everything, to, to reach through our encryption and such, it's pushing certain people to places like this. Is that a bad thing? 
Again, my reaction may be surprising to say it's not a bad thing, but it's a natural consequence of being human. So let's put it this way. Privacy is an inherent human right, and it's a requirement for maintaining our human condition. It is a good thing. It is a good thing that we have that. You may then ask, all right, given this technology, why haven't we fallen into a dystopian world of 1984? The governments have this technology upon us. And I think it's exactly the reverse of what Bruce is saying here, that I trust in the goodness of the human spirit to push back against that kind of oppression. Yes, it's not equal. It's not evenly distributed. We do see this kind of oppression in various parts of the world, but I have confidence in the human spirit to achieve that balance over time. What then of the future? Are governments going to be unnecessary? Absolutely not. As we look at the fundamental changes that shape us over time, we see population rising, we see climate change, undeniable climate change. We see the greater interconnection of ourselves in ways we never could have anticipated that yields us to be richer, but also more fragile. Now, one of the things that's happening is the creation of these smart cities. And it's an interesting phenomenon that could have only happened thanks to computing. King Abdullah's economic cities, about 100 cities are being created in India as well that are cities from whole cloth, starting from scratch. And their intent is, this is an artist re rendering of one of the smart cities coming from India. One of the ideas is, let's build a city from scratch and put into it smart buildings, smart roads, so that we can, from up front, use our computing infrastructure to help the health and happiness and safety of our people. It's an interesting experiment. It's one of the first times, really, we've seen new cities grow like this. There are a few other instances, but one out of whole cloth, it's something to watch over time. What you see here is a real-time image of a site called TweetPing that's looking at real-time tweets that are happening. And it's overlaid just very faintly upon the interconnections that we see among the billion or so people that are connected via Facebook. Now I look at this and for me it's a thing of beauty because what I'm seeing here is that computing has enabled ways of connecting us in ways that the framers of our constitution could never have done so, in ways that transcend national boundaries, in ways that give rise to patterns of communication that transcend our nations. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it's certainly a thing. Does it mean we're going to replace our governments? No, because as I said in the previous slide, there are things that governments do that we ourselves cannot do. And so we band together, but these kinds of structures give us ways to put ourselves together in ways we could not have done so before. There is this balance, therefore. We see on the one hand that computing has amplified the reach of governments, and that's a good thing. But it is also tempered what governments can do because of this kind of communication that transcends governments. It pushes back against the tyranny that governments we wish to use upon us, thus the activists and the hacktivists we saw. At the same time, the same is true for governments. Governments provide a focus for our computing activity. The world does not need yet another Tinder application. Not a bad thing, but we see VCs pouring money into it, but we see the opportunities that our open data can bring to us and governments provide us the resources to focus upon the greater health and happiness of, of our individuals corporately. And it's also the case governments make it such that they create a forum for discussion about what can be done. Computing makes things possible, but not all things that are possible should be done, and that's what's best dealt with in the place of governments. So what is the future of governments? For me, it really ends up being at the intersection of computing and the human experience. Thank you very much. I think we have time for a few questions. Let me start, because not everybody here would have heard the previous lectures. Let me start by just asking you to talk a bit about this project overall, how sure. it got started, and what the, what the vision is for this. Well, it kind of got started because of you. It's all well, that's not entirely true. <laughs> um, I was in an interesting place in my career, and I remember having a discussion with you about, you know, when's the museum going to do something like Sagan's Cosmos? And we had a discussion about it that basically inspired me to give thought mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. That was from five or six years ago. And so, thank you for that. So my wife and I began on a journey to say, you know, I have, I've been an insider to computing, and 
I want to give back to the world because I have a unique perspective, I think. It, it is a perspective. And I want to take what I've done and you know, make visible to the general public and excite them about computing as much as I am excited. There is a, a beauty and an elegance to computing in ways that I think the general public does not see. We want to expose the world to it. I'm also the case, much like what code.org speaks of, that you know, everybody needs to learn how to code. Well, not exactly. I think everybody needs to have some degree of computational thinking. And so our intent is to expose some of the history of computing, certainly tell some of the science, but as we often say, an educated populace is best able to reconcile its past, deal with its present, and be intentional about its future. Given that computing is very much a part of everybody's future, that's why we're doing this. Right. So thank you for bringing us to KQED as well. Absolutely. Uh, that was a great journey to bring us to PBS. And you know, we're moving forward. We're moving forward. That's great. I'm ready for my, uh, my close-up, Mr. DeMille. You are ready. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, also, someone had asked where, where they could go to find out more about the project, and so we should just give a little plug to your sure. website. Here's the website, right computingthehumanexperience.com. Uh, the last three lectures have been recorded, and they are there. Thank you again yep. to the museum. This, this one will be up there as well. So thank you. I have <laughs> podcasts for about 20 different articles I've done, so lots of fun things. And I'm looking for volunteers. So we have a large research site, which I've collected several thousands of bits of data, and I'm sort of crowdsourcing the help there. So, And authors. Oh, yes, and authors. We have a book contract with O'Reilly, and we're looking for people who have some interesting things on in the intersection of computing and the human experience. So come reach out to us, please. That's great. Well, you were ahead of your time, because uh, I don't know if you know that the new head of the National Endowment for the Humanities, ha has said that she feels the intersection of the humanities and technology ought to be at the center of what the NEH is doing. Now, she's only said this very recently, so well, let's, we can let's both hear a grant application in, in mind for that. But, let's go uh, fly out and meet her. What, this you do, is, what you doing tomorrow? <laughs> she's, you were about five years ahead of that, which is great. Uh, let's, let's talk about, we've got some great questions about the substance of your talk here. Uh, first of all, I think this is, this is a, a really great, great question, which is laws, laws appear to be unable to maintain pace with technology's advancements. Any thoughts on how to close that gap? Do you agree with the assumption that laws are not able to keep up? Laws are not able to keep up, by, by all means. Now, I'm going to give you two answers to the question. The first answer is, it's not a bad thing that laws are not able to keep up. Imagine for a moment if we had the full rule of law concerning everything we might know about the internet would never have given us the space to allow the kinds of invention that was possible. And so having that gap is a good thing in a way. And yet the laws are also a good thing because as the technology moves its way into the interstitial spaces of the world, it has consequences beyond what the individual developer has done. The line I used to say, I often say is, every line of code you write has a moral implication. And it's taking a while for the law to catch up to that reality. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a good thing. That, that's all I'll say. Okay. Go. Yeah, good, 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 good question. Net neutrality. Uh, someone's asked the other, another really intelligent question here, which is why is it important for me as an individual citizen to care about something like net neutrality, which is at its heart a government policy? It is at its heart a government policy. Um, the whole language around net neutrality is a difficult one because on its face value, net neutrality sounds like it's something you want to buy into. It's like the Patriot Act, of course I'm a patriot. Yeah, Therefore, right. it must be a good thing. Uh, and ditto with net, net neutrality. It's a much more complicated thing. So I'm going to pull away the specific elements of what's going on in the law because I'm not a legal authority by any means. But I will say that the battleground is effectively who controls the lines of communication? And is that something that could make possible biases in the use of it in ways that are unanticipated? So on the one hand, you see enterprises, the backbone providers in particular, who push back against it because they want the degrees of freedom. On the other hand, you see governments that say, but wait a minute, we have the health and needs of the general public in place, let's weigh these off, they're out of balance. Mm -hmm. And they are out of balance, and so the whole issue of network neutrality is one that provides the balance for the average citizen, but yet respecting the needs of the businesses themselves, and we aren't there. Let's go back to Snowden uh, for a minute and his disclosures. First of all, 
Do you think Edward Snowden is doing us all a favor by this, this trickle strategy of, of bit by bit releasing these kind of bombshell disclosures? The, the latest is the, the ability and apparently the act by the NSA of embedding code in the firmware of mobile devices so that every mobile communication from any of these devices can be, right. can be intercepted. Well, wow, that's a tough one. If I were Snowden, would I have done what he would have done? Couldn't have left my wife behind. I would have taken her with me <laughs> to begin with. Um, <clears throat> nothing that Snowden has said has been a surprise to me. It truly hasn't because I kind of expected that our government would do all those things. And therefore, him trickling it out as a strategy he's chosen, probably as a matter of self-preservation would be my guess, because he needs to keep himself relevant and alive. And so putting myself in his head, you ought to ask him that question, but that's my guess of his strategy. But no matter what he has said, and I think no matter what he may say, is not coming as a surprise to me. But the fact that it is documented and there is evidence, I think, is the right thing. Mm. You, let, me, let me end up by saying this. It may be a reasonable strategy that he's done this because every one of these revelations has been something that we as a nation and as individuals have had to metabolize. To get it all at once, I think it may have lessened the impact of each of those specific things. So maybe it's a good thing. So yes, I end up, it was a good idea. You end up, you end up in a good place yes. with that, okay. Uh, let me ask you another question about, um, this is related to your quote about uh, networks uh, view uh, the shutting down of a network is damaged and therefore route around it. So that's, that's why it's difficult to shut a network down. Is there, a is there a possible day in software that code will understand that there is rogue code out there, like something embedded in the firmware of a phone, for example, and just simply route around it so that the, the code itself can't be harmful? Is it capable of being done without, without uh, with just the operation of the code itself? It's actually already being done, but in a negative way. We see some incredibly intelligent viruses that are being created that can detect if they are being tampered with. And so already see that kind of code and in the viruses themselves, or... and it becomes self-healing as well. So we see that in the small, and certainly it is possible in the large as well, this notion of these self-healing and self-aware networks. Is that being done by, because of security now, or is it being... I can tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to live, so I'm not going to press that one any further. <laughs> Someone said here, uh, and it's a question that we got when we were putting Revolution together, and uh, we continue to get from visitors from time to time, about the link between computing and Nazi Germany and, uh, and the Holocaust. You didn't, you didn't mention that specifically, but is there, have you studied that? Is there any lesson we can draw from that in the context of this whole experience? I have. I mean, Black's book on the subject, I think, is the go-to one. Um, let me give you a personal story. My mother, full-blooded German. She grew up, she was in her 20s during the war, married uh, a German soldier, not a Nazi. He was sent off to war. And uh, he was reported missing in action and then killed in action. At the end of the war, she became a translator for the Allied forces, met who became my father, they got married, and we believe, as we piece this together, shortly thereafter, her husband showed up. So what you see here is in the fog of war, some tremendous things happen, heartbreaking stories. Mm -hmm. It's the case that it's hard for me to go back to those times and say what was right or not, because we know in every age, in every war, in every conflict like that, governments use every resource at their disposal to further their means. Should we protest the use of phones? Should we protest the use of, of uh, Twitter? Should we protest the use of, of the internet itself? Because every regime has done so. So the lesson for me, I think, is twofold. The first is that, uh, again, governments use every resource at their disposal and that those resources can be used for bad as well as good. We see today, for example, uh, networks that bring together the stories of Holocaust survivors in ways that would not be possible for uh, otherwise. And I think the other lesson for me is that this is why the balance is so important, that why transparency and openness of our technology is important to balance against what the governments can do mm -hmm. for us. 
The last question from the audience is, uh, okay, so we can limit and balance government power. What about corporate power to do some of these very same things? Well, you know, that's an interesting one because I alluded to this at the end, the growth of non-government organizations. That's what multinational corporations are these days. They transcend individual boundaries of, of, of countries, and they're acting in ways where, again, the law hasn't quite caught up to it by any means. What are the checks and balances we have there? Again, this is a place where we're out of whack. The law itself is not caught up. So when things like what happens to Sony happen, they impact not just the corporation, they impact all of us. I think what will happen is that, again, as corporations become more savvy with the use of technology, as we as individuals become more savvy with what corporations can do with it and can have that kind of voice. The same kind of activism and hacktivism we see with governments, we see also applying to mm. corporations mm. as well. It is that balance. I've got one more sure. question uh, myself, but before I do that, you mentioned the imitation game. Yes. I can now reveal, now that it's not going to happen, that <laughs> uh, tonight, and this, we, had a, we had a screening of the imitation yeah. game, a pre-screening yeah. in December, and tonight, in this very auditorium, we were going to have a second screening of the imitation game, staged by the Weinstein Company, with Benedict Cumberbatch as the guest. Ooh. However, in the interim, he decided to go off and get married in the Isle of Wight, and he's spending his honeymoon in L.A. this weekend. The CAD. The Oscars are on Sunday, so <laughs> what nerve. I, I was hoping to be able to announce we were, we were having a, a preview of, or the, a screening of the movie with Cumberbatch here, but... We know where his priorities are. So close. We can, <laughs> so close. Uh, so, if I may interrupt, you yes. guys provided Enigma machine for that, didn't you? We did. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. It's on the cover of Time Magazine. All right. Can I have your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get Benedict to maybe get an autograph or two. Uh, so the final question is, um, this, I think, is architected as an 11-part series. Mm -hmm. We're now about halfway through. Mm -hmm. What's next? What's the next one on your list? We'll hear from you again uh, from when you come back. Well, we're looking at perhaps the one of computing and, um, and communities, I believe is our next one. We've considered community in isolation. Yes, community in isolation. Yeah, so yeah. Th there's an interesting triad that goes along here. Can I have a minute to explain Absolutely, sort of the please, architecture? Yeah. So if you look at how we've architected this series, there's an opening episode that introduces the importance of computational thinking and what it means. So it introduces the general public to what that is. And the premise here is that just as we see incredible beauty in the universe, and we study it by looking at complex things and reducing it to simple things, computing does the reverse. We take very simple things, we build these elegant structures. And so the first episode is an approach to that from the reverse of how physics looks at it. The next two chapters slash episodes deal with the foundations of modern computing, the first of which is computing in conflict, which we've lectured on already, the premise being that much of what's in computing came about through World War II and the Cold War. The second parallel episode dealing with computing and commerce, how computing has changed the, the frictionless nature of, com uh, of commerce. And so we'll, we'll talk about high frequency trading and the like. The next six episodes, we're actually up to 12 now, deal with specific aspects of the human experience, computing and faith, computing and art, computing and science, computing and community, computing and government, uh, and computing in just daily life. Then we want to step back and say, well, computing makes all sorts of things possible. What can computing do? So we'll look at the boundaries of computation. In the last two episodes, we lumped into one lecture so far. One is which of, of computing and how it extends the human body, computing and robotics, and also computing and the computability of the mind, which leads at the end asking the question, what's really the future of humanity? Great. So, no small questions. Can't wait. Well, and we've got a lot more to go. So thank you very, very much thank for you. being here. Thanks to everybody for being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Well Thanks. done. Yeah. Yeah.